Hey Scott. Are you laughing? You having fun? Yeah. Having a blast. Greetings. I just was outside for the first time. Me too. Me too. Why I walked out rolling the whole cross street to get a sandwich. That's what I did. First time I go, God, it's really nice here. <laughs> Boy, it's in Miami. It's kind of hot out here. Yeah. yeah. How are things up in uh Virginia Mason? Yeah, hold on. who's who's with you now? Um, that's not, and, you know, not my, my, my uh, partner, Tom Beal, who's been there for, oh, yeah, for what a nice guy, yeah, super nice guy. And then, um, I recruited when Jean Fabio and Anna left, I recruited Lauren Wancata, oh, who she was trained by Susan. Oh, I see, a waitress, you, and she's really, really good, really great person. She's had a baby, so mm -hmm. she was off the train leave for two months. It was basically me and Tom, mm -hmm. you know, running the place. <clears throat> We're trying to uh, recruit a fourth person. Really need need some complementary strengths, mm -hmm. you know. <clears throat> but uh, you know, we got taken over by this big conglomerate. Oh, all, right, and they just completely put the screws on everything. Okay, so. Yeah. Hey, Scott, how's it going? Great meeting. I know, it's wonderful, wonderful call yesterday. Oh, thank you, Scott. I enjoyed meeting your family. Oh, my gosh. I enjoyed meeting you. Say Bob. Uh, but, but that's, uh, that's forever his name. What's the Munchkin's name? Munchkin oh, Yeah. So cute. Yeah. 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 I As you were looking at him and talking to him, he started crying. I know. <laughs> he was so cute. Oh my gosh. Man, they all are gorgeous, aren't they? Oh, that kind of beauty is indescribable. You know, it's interesting. I mean, I used to walk around and thought my children were the most beautiful things that ever walked the earth. And then I looked at other kids, that's a fine looking kid. Or that, but yeah. you know, it's kind of gross. It's jewel. <laughs> and my kid's jewel is beautiful. And I was yeah, like, exactly. hey, why is yeah. that? You don't, because they're, they're from you. <laughs> yeah, they're exactly. You. You just, uh, like everyone else thinks he's funny looking, yeah. but to me, he's the greatest thing in or not. Respect that. There you go. Have a good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adnan Hassan. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here. Sorry for uh, my voice. Uh, it's what happens when we have a conference in the end. You have to scream over the music. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. If you don't mind putting up the first slides. So my name is Adnan Hassan. I'm, I'm an age group and I'm a conservative at, at uh, UCSF. The good news is my talk is only like four minutes, so I don't have to uh, uh, scream for much. But I'm really looking forward for a very interactive um, and, uh, uh, feedback session. So we're looking forward to that. Um, not no, nothing that's relevant in terms of disclosures. So this is the the what we're planning here today. Uh, something happened to the font, so I apologize. But as you can see, we basically have a very short, very abbreviated, about 25 minutes where uh, we're going to basically give you guys a little bit of a summary about what's been going on for the last year and a half. The point of this is not going to be to be exhausted, but mostly to get everyone on the same page about where we are. And then after that, we're going to ask uh, some of the senior leaders in education to come up, and we're going to ha have uh, some questions for them. 
time to start up the discussion, and then we'll have an open floor and discussion, mostly really well, for us to get feedback from the group. This is a very important topic to the society, important to us, important to you. We realize that, and we uh, uh, hopefully you'll see that through the, the process that this part, this the SWAT has been going on now for a year and a half. But uh, Dr. Visser and and, and uh, the group led is uh, is really very thoughtful and very high evidence driven, particularly because we realize how important this is to the to the entire society and also to the membership at large. So, the, but. At the same time, we need to make sure that we get feedback from the group. So that's going to be the, the point in all of this. So first step is why? Why even do this? Why, why are we even talking about this? And there's a lot of ways you can approach the why. And in fact, if you were at the plenary session yesterday, you saw some of that reason. Uh, and I, I guess I see, I think I see the presenter out right there. And there's a lot of different reasons. Team members. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I do actually have a slide next. So uh, I thought it was God talking to me. Sorry. All right. So and then, 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 but, but you can approach this in many different ways. The first way is to basically say, look what was happening to the changes in, in uh, your sister pathways in, in uh, uh, CGSO or ASTS pathways, and a significant amount of changes is happening. Not good or bad, but something that we all learn from. Look at what's going on in terms of the variation of requirements. If you look at those three pathways, the variation in requirements is truly significant. And I'm not talking about just number of cases, but also the, the curriculum itself, the importance of oncology, the importance of actually transplant, the idea of looking at MIS and where that fits in, vascular sections, a lot of things that we see multi society standards of care, and then we see requirements of education that actually don't fulfill that standard of care. So it's either we don't believe what the society guidelines are overproducing people that don't actually fit what we say is the standard of care, which doesn't make sense. So it's got to be one or the other. The other thing that we're having uh, that we have to look at is the, the explosion of the multi um, fellowship uh, roles and people doing multi fellowships and this idea of dual accreditation. Which is you can look at it as good and bad, but it's actually uh, you know having these three these three pathways, and now really realistically, if you look at dual pathways, five pathways is incredibly confusing to applicants that who are interested in, in, in HPV, and you're like, which way do I go? And it's actually not a very easy answer at all, even for people who are in the field like ourselves. And then there's the issue of overtraining and again. But yesterday morning, and this is a slide with permission from the uh, uh, group who's sitting right here. And as you can see, a significant issue with overtraining. And if you were in the preliminary session, you, you realize that we, we basically are in a situation that even with some standardization, which is very difficult in America, there is a significant overtraining burden, especially when you look at basically the number of cases that we're saying that it's important to actually keep somebody competent. So with all of this, uh, it was the wisdom of the executive group with Dr. Tim Pollack and Dr. Uh, Mike D'Angelica and, uh, and um, uh, Dr. Doyle, who actually started this SWAT group to basically say, we need to figure out what's going on and where should we be going? And this is the group that did all the work. And not just, uh, you know, just to point out in terms of demographic diversity and geographic diversity is important, but also realize that some of these people are surgical oncology trained and practice surgical oncology, and some of them are ASTS trained and practice transplant. So we're not really doing this and saying, oh, let's just look at, at the HPV, HPVA workforce. This is truly a diverse group. And basically, four studies happened, and we did this on purpose because we wanted to do it right, and we wanted to do it uh, methodically, and I'm very thankful to Dr. D'Angelica for, for funding some of this, because we did actually require to hire PhD uh, uh, sociologists that are actually expertise in health and work for in, in health workforce assessment. Uh, and qualitative studies. And so basically four studies happened. We look at the founders, um, uh, we used to call them the, 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 uh, the elders, but then you know some people like Dr. Helton got offended. So we basically put this as founders. And, and the idea is we, we did not want to make this into a survey. <laughs> I want to make this into a survey because there was a lot of crazy. So we actually had two in-depth interviews, basically two people interviewing them, collecting the data uh, in, a, in a quantitative fashion and having a quantitative expert follow them. We also did the, the program lectures and specifically 
also go through those, uh, those that were AHP that were put on the truth and actually transferred to deal accreditation, which are no longer under the AHPBA per se, but deal accreditation PDs will include them to understand what's going on there. And then we did that in the interim call for the faction to be able to go into depth and not to miss people who are busy and who are who, are, who may miss an email or things like that. And then we also looked at the, the, the graduates uh, of the HBBA fellowships. Obviously, those are people like hundreds. And so for those who couldn't do a qualitative study, so we did a survey study with, with some of its biases. And then lastly, we needed to understand the marketplace. And by that, we, by that we mean the chairs and the chiefs who are hiring people and the CFOs and CEOs of Evidences and Kaisers and a lot of the people who are hiring a lot of HPV surgical oncology or SDS folks to understand what is what, what do they think of what's going on in the workplace. So a lot of data went into this. And long story short, the HPV journal uh, was very very kind to us and, and allowed us to allowing us to publish two opinion and three original articles at the same time. If you QR code this, you'll get all five uh, papers. Um, uh, Downloadable. It's okay. You can. It's it, it's you know. It's a millennial age. You could do it. It's alright. It's uh, some people are like ashamed of doing it. But uh, so we'll get all five of them. And I encourage you to do that. What we're going to do today now is we're going to have uh, each of those papers summarized very briefly because again the point of this is not for us to be talking, but just to get everybody on the same page. And then after that. Uh, we're going to have uh, the, the leaders come up here and we're going to have a panel and then have a discussion. So again, next I'm going to ask Dr. Warner to come up and, uh, and, um, and then after that it will be Dr. Washington, Dr. Babiki, and then Dr. Uh, Visser will, will, will uh, summarize all that up. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you also uh, to, uh, to Dr. Visser for intentionally and well crafted. Um, what we found time and time again, yes, anytime we got into the discussion, it was a little bit of data. I agree that we were going to do it. So we just really excited to put it together and really go for it. So I think we're having a foresight to, to keep in this group. So I'm going to be trying to abstract from the Russian elders' elders' paper. And then the issue is not analysis, it's much perspective. So we have uh, the way that we should be trying to look at and do something for the purpose of the community. It's really about what is better than what I did. Thank you. 
So from Washington and uh, Fort Worth, Texas. So I am giving the fellow perspective. We um, did a <laughs> short. Um, we also did a survey of the fellows, which I'm um, mentioned initially, and some of the elements of that. 
Right. Hi, I'm Nikki Babaki. Um, I'm a surgeon surgeon and surgical oncologist at Providence Medical Center. And today I'm presenting the first thing I'm going to do to the high risk of cancer. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank 
Um, so my job is to try to sort of wrap this up and we'll talk about what we're going to talk about our final conclusions and we'll talk about at Stanford, I didn't brand my slides. Um, yeah, I would really encourage people to to look at the the primary manuscripts because there's a lot of data behind the comments and the themes that we're going through. Uh, obviously, we can touch on it and keep reiterating those themes, but I think if you see some of the primary data and the survey data, the fellows, uh, it's valuable in this uh, difficult discussion. I really want to thank this group again. It was a lot of work to try to assemble this. And, and as, as we talked about, and I think it really we worked very hard to be coming at this 
understanding that the HPBA is a society that brings together different specialties and that those voices need to be heard. And while we can only start to take action for this society, that we really do believe that this is something that we should be wrestling with in our broader community and the, the other common societies over time, but that we also can't wait for that discussion and all three societies to come together, because in some sense, we sort of have to work on cleaning up our own house and then uh, hope that they will come along with us and 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 address these broader issues that the market actually would, would like us to, to, to address. As we looked at these different stakeholders, there were very powerful common themes that you've heard today, right? There's concern out there, top to bottom trainees to hiring managers that the caliber and experience of practicing HPV surgeons is inconsistent. That these training programs vary quite widely. They're quite ahead of the interest group. And, and I think we know that, and there is strength in that, but there's also concern that the product we are turning out, therefore, is not uniform, and it's honestly not super transparent. And I think that is something I will believe that the other societies wrestle with as well. The value of the HPVA certificate right now is a little bit unclear in this Wild West market out there for these small number of jobs. And, and there's a lot of anxiety that you heard quite probably today. Uh, and that there is an oversupply of HPV surgeons, and, and, and Mike made this a, a, a point last year in his presidential address, that is something we really have to, I think, face. So in the manuscript that wraps up these, uh, this is the um, graphic. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to touch on each of these again to sort of bring them home. This perhaps is the most, or it's not the most important, but it is one that we're moving forward with first, because in some ways it is the lower hanging challenges that we can address first and foremost. So there was broad consensus that we really need to standardize curricula and broaden the requirements. And we honestly refer to this as sort of the raise the bar. So we believe uh, across all of the, the stakeholders, frankly, and across all the members of the SWAT committee from all the diverse representation, that the HPBA should be setting the quality bar for this specialty and that that's really a core fundamental value in this society. So that means establishing core competencies with annual assessment of the volume uh, and core competencies while training. These case volume minimums may well be part of that. And that was an assessment that the complexity of surgery of our field in particular has grown so dramatically. My one year fellowship where I had to do a left hepatectomy and a right hepatectomy and an open lip on, and a, you know, an open MIS pancreatectomy, that was a different time. Asking all our fellows to do all of those via multiple techniques, to do that on with with multivisceral resections and venous and, and arterial reconstructions, this field is is blowing up in terms of its complexity, and and we need to reflect that in the requirements of our training so that we are turning out folks who are competent in those. Uh, we want to support very strongly, and this was messaged from program directors and from fellows who thought this was really a very positive thing to consider really strong fellowship exchanges to really augment those programs that don't have every one of these elements, but we must have really valuable contributions to training. And there's very broad consensus among stakeholders that one year of postgraduate, meaning post-general surgery training, is no longer, in, in most cases, likely turning out a fully formed surgeon. And two years of fellowship training, and that can look differently for different, look different for different fellows, is almost certainly the right way forward, including interestingly, almost unanimous consensus among graduates in the survey, including those who had graduated from one year fellowships with respect to their readiness. We also felt that we really need to codify the value of training. The HPBA is the least formalized compared to the, uh, the, the among the three societies. And so ultimately we felt that we need an in-training formative examination, an in-service exam, so to speak, just like our general surgery residents, to push the fellows to really improve their didactic game. Right? The expectation is they need to learn and read the literature. We've made adjustments in, in the in the HPDA grand rounds for the fellows to really drive them to go to the literature and make decisions on an evidence basis. We felt that this would be part of that is having the annual examination to really drive that the didactic learning that we expect them to walk away with in, in terms of a body of knowledge. There was a very uh, significant momentum to move forward with a summative oral examination upon completion of training to establish if, are in fact, these graduates are really safe. 
and that that you know, a, a final oral examination, if anything, is is that's the best uh, a really important metric of that. There's a great deal of momentum towards operative skills assessment, objective skills assessment, and I think we can look to other groups, including Japanese uh, HPV surgeons, in terms of initiating video-based formal assessment of our graduates. The technology has just become more accessible. Our number of graduates is modest enough that this therefore becomes feasible to really say we can actually say with confidence that this graduate can do that unsinate SNA dissection safely when they are then doing that on their own without without a senior uh, mentor to necessarily be available to them. Job marketability. This one is is honestly sort of a part of the long game as once we've cleaned up our house a little bit in terms of what our graduates are. If we believe that we can set the bar for the highest level of training and the safest surgeons to, that we are going to provide to the community to serve patients with HPV diseases, then we really want to figure out if this society can begin to encourage volume and certification requirements for hospital privileging and hiring. And, and obviously, we would absolutely welcome and want to work with our sister societies to figure out what that looks like so that in this crowded field, we are identifying the safest surgeons and helping hospitals to identify that because they are not certain. And that came out quite clearly in these interviews. Hmm. There's a strong, a strong feeling that we need to improve messaging from the HPBA um, to prospective applicants and the surgical community regarding the, the HPBA value, the value of this of this training line. In a sense, this is we to do more marketing. Um, and and as, as Susie brought up, we have obviously a, a increasingly broad practice patterns among HPB surgeons, and there has been portions of the country that are being underserved. And so a number of our graduates uh, are actually going to traditional settings to practice HPV surgery. And we really need to identify appropriate pathways to best prepare those graduates to work in that practice pattern, as opposed to sort of a, what had been a traditional emphasis on, on academic institutions and HPV surgeons in that setting. That in terms of hiring needs, there is work to be done. Right. As we send these graduates out, I think we need to continue to, and, and great efforts have been made actually already, but this needs to continue to grow, to facilitate early career coaching and mentoring for those who are starting new practices to make sure that they, in fact, stay safe and continue to grow in their skill set and confidence. We want from um, the, the fellowship graduates so that we know exactly what their experience was and to improve our programming. While fellowship graduates actually give data to the fellowship council on the HPBA side, that actually is not shared as broadly, and we're not uh, accessing that data routinely to sort of look back in the mirror at ourselves. Um, and then, as I, I mentioned earlier, we want to start to work towards figuring out how to work with hospitals to establish uh, privileging criteria in the long term and some guidance for what is going to be a safe practice on an ongoing basis. There was very broad excitement and uh, and out uh, growing a more diverse HPB workforce. I should say that if I look at the HPBA Grand Rounds and the fellows this year, I think this is the most diverse group I can recall, and I think there's a, it's honestly quite exciting. That pipeline is lean, and if it is not intentional and ongoing, we would have a, a great diversity year in terms of all the backgrounds that we have in our current class. And then I think we can go easily fall back and have leading classes that don't continue to train a workforce that reflects the population that we serve. And so there's a lot of interest among all parties in working on that. That includes even the simple things like the fact that we now have uh, record keeping so that we know where we are. Because truthfully, like most societies, we didn't actually even have a yardstick historically because we were not recording that data. So in conclusion, before I say what our first steps forward are, the, the feeling out of this group and, and from all of the stakeholders is that the, the HPBA should be working to set the standard. And this is a core value of this society of training surgeons to the highest quality. Uh, and, and we need to elevate the value of the certificate from the society by defining what our product is. Clear messaging, creation of core competencies. Honestly, test them, make sure that they are what we think they are. Overall, there's obviously, as we do this, we also really have to be reaching out and address the elephant in the room that, that we all know, but I've not yet really grappled with, is that we are training too many and we need to figure out how to address that.
So actions, there's already steps that are moving forward. The um, HPA Executive Council has, in fact, decided to move forward with two task forces to help address the concerns and, and um, plans made by the SWAT group. One is a sort of what we're going to informally call Raise the Bar Task Force. That's a deep dive into the curriculum to figure out how we really can enrich it and, and broaden the expectations of what um, the, this looks like. With all those elements, MIS has got to be a thing. Vascular sections, now standard. All of those elements need to be really incorporated into a task force. We'll look into that. That'll be representatives from education and training, program directors, because we obviously live in the real world. We need folks who are doing the training on the ground. And, and there's members of this team that have an incredible passion and that will also uh, be involved. And then another separate task force that will move forward with assessment of competency. And that's a complex uh, issue in and of itself to figure out how to move forward with both uh, the didactic and technical assessment of these fellows in terms of formative examination, summative examination, and video-based assessments to really move forward with creating an entrustable HPB surgeon in, in the current uh, lingo. Again, I encourage you all to look at these uh, principal papers. So we're going to make a transition now. If I can invite our um, education leaders up, I'm going to drop the word senior. Our education leaders up to the um, table here. So our plans that you know, we're going to have a discussion and ask a couple of questions and, and let folks who honestly have helped us get to where we are, which is far. And while there's a lot of anguish and 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 recognition of need for evolution, this it has been a, a very powerful training pathway now for uh, so many years. And and some of these are the leaders who have gotten us to where we are. Yeah. Looking for Sean Cleary. If anyone sees him, grab him by the collar. Oh, he's got a call. Got it. Hopefully, it's not a bad complication. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I've never gotten pulled out of a meeting for a uh, text. Okay. So, you know, I, I'm, I have a couple of questions that I was going to throw out there, but I uh, we obviously want to keep this wide open in, in terms of. In, uh, ideas or reflections on, on the material that's been presented today. But I'll start with a couple of questions, if I may. Uh, Scott Alton, I'm, I'm truly one of the founding members of this society and, and a past president and a leader in this field for, for quite a time. So can you reflect on what you see as the gaps that you, honestly, both for your own program and when we look at the spectrum of programs out there, but the gaps that we should be addressing as a standard for all fellows? And then maybe if you could reflect upon fellow exchanges for us. Um. <laughs> Said old man. Um, I'm not sure I can adequately address your question but what i will tell you out of all the stuff you just went through to me the biggest challenge facing us is educating um hospital leaders and and you know i, I think that's what we're getting at when you're saying we have to increase the value of our certificates what actually means something and then we can say to the healthcare system in the united states if you want uh, high value healthcare, this is a component of it. You know, we strongly in um, this discipline, there's different reasons that exist, because there's still um, a huge deficit in that respect. Like you, you, someone started off by saying, there's lack of appreciation and knowledge by uh, the healthcare system of what an HPV surgeon is. And so um, I think that uh, um, one of the biggest changes that I witnessed um, that's happening right now is like one of the fellows going, the graduate fellows, they're not going to the university hospitals, to community hospitals, to meet the desire of patients to travel. Some sophisticated analyses looking at uh, where patients go for their care, you know, the quality, um, so the quality and, and, and the like. And, and so, for example, despite there being clear differences in 
expertise in the, in the few hospitals that do HPV surgery, numbers haven't changed. Still stay in the communities and get what was done by surgeons that didn't find a year or so. And so I think one of the one of the barriers to this whole thing, one of the challenges is going to be the education of, um, of the hospital system, you know, and, and I'm I'm really worried about it because just at least in my state, um, corporate medicine was taken over, and it's all about the bottom line. You know, it's not about quality and safety anymore. It's about the bottom line, and uh, corporate mega mega corporations now, you know, the for profit system taking over the medical care industry, I think was a big problem in, in, um, in instituting so the proposals, you know, I really worry about that. Um, but with respect to your second question about exchanges, I think that there is sufficient evidence that is coming out of those programs that have done exchanges that's of tremendous value to the trainees. Um, I should a memorial um, and, and both those institutions probably do have uh, shortcomings at all, but they have you know a heavy oncology practice and a state of the art transplant. Transplants done in the middle, right? Those files, a tremendous benefit. So, this was trained, like when I trained at Toronto, right? I was six months transplant, six months HPV. So, I had that benefit, but most of the fellows today don't. And so, I don't understand this in a sense. So Susan and I, we got permission from. This council, I think, but we had to go through the fellowship council. Uh, we are two respective programs, uh, which are separated by about 150 miles. Uh, and this is uh, 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 transplants. So that exposure. In Susan's program, they were a little bit weak on complex advanced pancreas cases. So, exchange. Now, unfortunately, the first exchange happened during COVID, uh, and that screwed things up. Our exchange last year um, was fantastic. Kimberly is in her second. She uh, spent six weeks with us. Was Saji or fellow? I'm sorry. Yeah, so it was a swap at the same time. It, it logistically spent a year. Someone knows the funding and, and the money, and I can see in my program. We're fortunate to have the resources for me to include the expense. Everything we put in the world, uh, maybe Kimberly to come on it, but um, I think that both the fellows helped tremendously. I thought went down here for six weeks and did electrons pants. She both was that. Kimberly saw some stuff she hadn't seen before. And, uh, she was in. It just started this year. respect. I think that's going to be an absolutely fabulous experience uh, for those three fellows that are uh, rotating. Between Santiago, Mexico City, and, and Sao Paulo, they will they will pick up stuff from each of those programs, uh, and it's going to be we're going to come out and be. Able. 
wide uh, diversity of, of training. And I would encourage, uh, I would encourage more exchanges be created um, where, where it's feasible and possible. Of course, it, it made it easier for us because geographically we're close, right? Yeah. Probably a much bigger challenge for, for you guys. Um, I think good opportunities for the AHPA as an organization to figure out how to facilitate those right on the administrative front and then perhaps even others. Um, but because uh, right now it's a one-off thing, that we figure out how to pair those to match strengths and opportunities rather than you know. Well, that's just that's just the reality. The reality is that there might be three in the area in very weak in another, and so they can't. Keep them. So complementing the programs, combining them in some shape or form, I think will create a much better educational process and, and uh, improve the value of the, of the future fellows. Jara, if I could ask you a question. Jara, as, as outgoing president, obviously was hugely involved in this. And as a transplanter, giving us also her response. I wanted to ask you about the piece about um, the evaluation of the fellows and oral examination. And if you could give the group, I've learned from you in this process a little bit about what the ASTS does, if you could give a little bit of insight into that and how you would see that could work for us. Sure, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to put Dr. Maynard down in the audience as well because she knows more about it than I do even. But when it comes to setting up um, an oral exam or a, 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 a written exam, you have to kind of have a team of people together to put questions together, and you have to have a team to test those questions uh, for answers. Generally speaking, it's obviously been a multiple choice um, uh, question format. At least that's what the um, ASTS has gone with. And then um, uh, an oral exam and you know getting standardized questions and, and putting that part together. We did the first uh, trial or the beta, I think, of the oral exam this year. Is that right, Sue? And um, uh, the, the, the whole thing has to be set up by a separate entity um, for, um, for legal uh, reasons. It can't be done under the um, umbrella of the AHPPA, so it's, it's kind of like a side organization, and it's in ASDS it's called the TAC. Um, uh, the person who's chairing the TAC at any one time sits on the executive um, or on the council of the organization, but it is, uh, you know, a separate entity. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I think um, uh, ASDS has done it to, again, it, it, you know, validate the value of the training. Um, I think so far it's been, uh, I'm interested to hear from anyone who's training in the audience um, or who's recently trained, you know, what you feel about doing another exam. I mean, a lot of people say, oh, the boards are all night moons, like if you're doing exams, you really want to add another exam onto your training. But if it gives you um, a better green check mark or, you know, it elevates your, um, the value of your training, um, it's probably worthwhile. Um, I'd be interested to hear comments from, from anybody else. And do I have anything? Am I forgetting anything from the tax side of things? <laughs> but, um, you know, but I, I think, I mean, I personally think um, I don't have to do the exam, the oral exam, or the written exam, I think it's a good idea. I think our fellows have uh, all done it. We do it at home. It's like you go somewhere to do the exam. You know, you do it at home, you're captured by somebody in the office. I mean, a certain amount of time to, to do the exam once you start it. Um, they operate at two separate times. It's not like the American Board's um, exams, but you, you they, they operate two separate times. You have to sit and have that time dedicated to do the exam and finish it. That's for the for the written, and then the oral is done on Zoom. So, you know, again, it's no travel cost. It's nothing. It's, it's easy to do it. But the setting up of it took um, a few years before they got up. And like I said, they've been working on this for several years. The oral exam has been, or the written exam has been in place now for, um, I think after beta testing, maybe two, five, five years, is it? And um, and so, um, and the oral exam has just come into play. And I should say, the, the vision is really to leverage the knowledge and expertise from our ASTS colleagues here and trying to learn from their experience and and uh, One other thing just uh, that I, I can say, and, and um, I know Dr. Manners will correct me if I'm wrong, but there's no dedicated HBB portion to the exam or HB&P, or there is. 
There is. So then, so everybody training in transplant, even if you're training as a kidney transplant surgeon, you still have to have knowledge in all of these areas. So all the more reason why we're, we may need, you know, to think about it for HPV again, if we want to elevate the value of the training in HPV. Um, Dr. Olaf, if you, if you, please reflect, of course, on any other comments or ideas you have, but also I was curious, Scott brought up this issue of sort of getting the word out, like this, how, what our graduates are, honestly, what the other graduates are also excel at, and having hospitals and credentialing groups understand that. Do you have any insights into how we can begin such a process? Thanks. Um, first of all, I want to thank the speakers today because that was an amazing set of uh, presentations and, and a lot of fun to it. I think we have a little bit of a different build up. So I hope you don't mind if I give you my opinion. First of all, that's old enough to build up a certificate in. Certificate. I just got an email a couple of days ago saying if you trained in English before 1997, you can apply for a transplant certificate. Just the certificates. But even today, I query you whether you wouldn't the value of the certificate for getting a job. It's jobs are really. Um, the certificate is to qualify that this person is qualified, and that's very important. But the idea that a certificate is something to get a job, I don't disagree, but I don't think it does because word of mouth and you know, credibility of someone. This world is still in a small world. I do believe that is probably much more valuable than just some um, stamp of approval. And my certificate says I'm a good surgeon in these areas. So I would argue that to worry about the value of the certificate, other sure we educate people and sort of have a as to who we graduate and how well they're qualified. I think that's very important. So that's one point. The other thing I think I understand, you know, your point about education scanning and, and getting the hospitals to buy in. Well, the hospital the most of them have no idea who you're having by those. I mean, it's up to the defense chiefs, the section chiefs, potentially the chairs. So I don't really think that's as important. But what I do think is really key about it's a little, um, I wasn't early to this point because I was working on a point that I had a job somewhere. Society should have a social hour that's in front of it, has all the characters, potential division chiefs, section chiefs. First year and second year. Together that allows people to say, well, this person's looking, it's not just go around and somebody approaches me and says, Oh, do you have a job? Or do you have, you know, I want to go to your fellowship? Or I have a fellow graduate. Do you guys have an open room? Get us all in the same room. Yeah. And have that be a formalized uh, get together at the HPBA because we do these, you know, at the bar people meet and at the beach or whatever, but not actually part of the program. So that is a mission that we really need to take over because I'm concerned, as we've everybody knows and talked about, that we have this great pipeline, but we don't have jobs from them. But let's get at least people in the same room to talk about it. Uh, uh, Dr. Cleary and then Dr. Mitney for that. So I I, I do want to just um, echo the you know I think that there are there's a role. So if you can turn your mic off. Um, I, I think that the, there is an emerging need for some sort of certification, and I think uh, Dr. Orloff brings up some absolutely fantastic points about um, about the 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 value of networking and the value of community, and, and that is just a plug to maintain your AHPBA membership. Um, but you know, one of the challenges is that. Um, 
you know, we do one is that the old person's network, uh, and I don't mean that as an ageism or, but, um, you know, but, uh, you know, the connections is a little bit of a situation that does perpetuate a little bias. It means that the established programs can continue to sort of uh, populate uh, things. And, and there's an opportunity for programs that are up and coming and emerging to uh, to develop these. And it's harder for those programs to place their graduates if we just purely rely on uh, connections and handshakes. Um, the other thing is that credentialing, I think, does have uh, a value because I, I can say from personal experience, so I was involved in two external reviews of surgeons that were recent graduates of another track programs. Unfortunately, the result of that process resulted in their dismissal. In both of those circumstances, their case logs met that tracks uh, criteria and that the program director and the chair of that department where they were trained both vouched for those individuals that they could uh, they could they were competent in HPV surgery and it became very unfortunately very apparent and extremely unfortunate for the patients that this was probably not a match in terms of that the, that surgeon's skill set knowledge base uh, and competencies. So I do think that uh, that unfortunately, uh, I'm always surprised by how many people hire surgeons without even talking to their prior chairs, prior division heads, prior program directors, but it happens. And even when they do, not every program director, chair, and, and division head is uh, thinking of the patients that person's going to operate on. They're looking for the reputation of their program or their institution. And so uh, we do need to make keep our standards high. We need to have an emblem of those standards to say that our graduates are simply the best at HPV surgery. And, uh, and I think that has meaning. Dr. Meiner, obviously, as a leader in education and working this towards competency-based uh, curriculum and sort of in establishing entrustable surgeons. So, mentor, there's not that second N that everybody wants to add. Um, so, thank, first of all, congratulations on all the incredible work you've done over the last year. I think the um, the thing that always strikes me is that, you know, we just keep repeating history. You know, we've we've had these conversations before. We previously met with the head of the um, American Hospital Association and had these conversations. I think the important thing to remember around the hospital side of this is that um, a hospitals are a state's rights issue. It is totally decentralized. There is no federal authority. And and on top of that, we're gonna, it's a shifting, it's shifting sands right now with the consolidation we're seeing in healthcare, which I think actually will lend in the future, a platform by which you can have conversations around quality with a hub and spoke system, but it is still largely individual hospitals setting individual credentialing criteria. And so I think that we really need to come back to what Sean has said, like, this is about the patient. And I would say right behind the patient is this is about our trainees. And the thing we're not saying, and I'm not going to be as subtle as Sean, is that I can tell you, having worked in this space for over a decade, and again, we're having this same conversations a decade later, is that what's really happened that's made it worse is this proliferation of CGSO fellowships. And the decrease of the bar that has that happened, and, and again, being at the front seat through all of this before there was ABS board certification, I saw the application, there was huge heterogeneity around the case volumes. And at that time, we we're actually in a better place than we are right now because programs had tracks under the SSO. There wasn't, you know, there were HPV tracks, there were breast tracks, et cetera. In order to get that recognition by the ABS, it had become very important because you have to go through the ACGME to have uniform criteria. That led to a lowering of the bar of a minimum of 35 GI cases. Well, a lot of programs now can come up with 35 cases because that's like gastrectomies, the colons, the liver, the pancreas, a liver biopsy counts for that, et cetera, et cetera. So now we've seen this huge proliferation of fellowships. And again, you're not going to easily fix the hospital thing. The community hospital is like, I need an HPV surgeon. And there's all these graduates who can't find jobs who need to pay their loans off, like Kim said, who need to get a job. And I will just tell you the moral distress, as we heard from Joe Shapiro, of a young surgeon coming out, doing these huge cases with no backup and having terrible complications. We recently had an incredibly well-trained 
person in northern Wisconsin who just left surgery altogether because she was devastated by that experience two years in. So it's not just the harm to the patients, it's the harm to our trainees. And what I would say is that now that there is a, you know, I get calls all the time in June from the Memorial and the MD Anderson fellows who don't have jobs yet. And those are the programs that you would think previously had jobs, you know, six months earlier. So it is a problem that we haven't policed ourselves on the supply side, and that is where we have the greatest control. All these other things are fantastic and wonderful, only if you can bring everybody into the same tent and get everybody to agree. So I think the conversations really need to be, I, you know, CGSO is very secure now within the ABS. I think it's time to go back to tracks, go back to, as you know, we're not seeing the same issue with ASTS because a transplant surgeon is not going into a community hospital and doing transplantation. It doesn't work that way. But in the community setting with the, with the CGSO certificate, they are. So it's time to come back to tracks. Then you can get everybody in the tent together to have a shared set of criteria and do your, the exams and do all these other things. But that's where I think there's the greatest opportunity for impact. If I, I may make a brief comment. If you recall the numbers of trainees out of the SSO and ASTS tracks, it's impressive. So obviously, while we're talking about cleaning up our own house, it honestly it has to be in cooperation with those two societies to recognize. And as you point out, ASTS fellows do not come out in the community and do um, transplants in the community, but they do. There are an excess of trainees over over demand, so they do come out in the community and do anything they can get their hands on, including a lot of out of their work. And in fact, if I look at the Bay Area, the the great majority of those sort of isolated surgeons who are doing a small number of these cases are in fact out of ASTS fellowships over the last decade or so. But perhaps uh, this is, I was actually saving some of the tough stuff for last year for Dr. D'Angelica to reflect on uh, oversupply because he has insight and, and passion. Yeah, I've, I've got a few points. It's great to listen to everybody here. This is a, a really interesting and difficult problem. Uh, it's always about the patients. I won't even mention that, but it, it, it I agree completely. It is about the training. I have never seen medical student or resident not get super excited to see that whoop or that major liberal section and say, I want to do this. Let me tell you all, there's a whole world out there besides doing whipples and liberal sections, trust me. And uh, it, it, what the bottom line is, we are, uh, our obligation is not just to train them well so they're able to do their job, but to make sure that they have a job that actually fulfills them. To do all that training, go out and work in a hospital that perhaps you never envisioned yourself in and only doing you know, I don't know, one a month. Why did you, why did I even train in this? Why did I spend my time? And that is not their problem. That is our problem. And we cannot uh, make that false promise anymore. So what does that mean? Exactly what you said. We have to limit the number of trainees, period. That is part of how you do that. Is that couch and the idea of increasing standards? Absolutely. Are there secondary benefits to that? Absolutely. And I would say that as you limit this, we have to partner with the ASTS and the uh, SSO because there are plenty of people who come from those programs who should never do HPV surgeons, surgery, including transplant surgeons. I'm sorry, transplant surgeons. There are plenty of you out there who should not be doing HPV, and there are plenty of surgical oncologists who should never touch the liver or pancreas because they haven't been trained to do it. So if you meet those requirements within those training paradigms, you, we need to partner with them, and they can check the box and take the test and however we organize it. But the the people that need it should be able to do it with those training programs with all of the concepts that you've brought up. So we have to control the product and that is going to require difficult decisions, cutting programs that are not up to the standard. And that's either we have the guts to do that or we don't. And if we don't, we'll suffer. And more importantly, the patients and trainees will suffer. I think the other thing we have to realize is that every HPV surgeon, and I may be one of the very few exceptions, We'll have to do something else, whether it's transplant or general surgery or MIS or whatever it is you do. You are not going to do four cases a week of HPV cases. Not going to happen. Not going to happen to anybody. So you need some other skills, whether that's transplant oncology, whatever it is you need to do. That. And that's got to be addressed in as we talk about this. I always have a fellow who comes up to me and says, I want to do HPV. How many times a week do you want to operate twice? How many cases do you want to do a day to... Great, you're the busiest HPV surgeon in the country. <laughs> Not going to happen. Um, and I think the other thing we have to realize, I keep hearing about we need HPV surgeons in community programs. I tell my patients I can be the greatest surgeon that ever existed, but if in, I'm in a hospital that does not have the team to manage my complications, which are inevitable, 
my outcomes will be terrible. So the hospital and the supporting staff is critical and regionalization in some form, the typical, typical, very confused and twisted American version of regionalization will be coming. And I think we have to be careful promising people you can go, yes, you can take that job in that community hospital and do liver and pancreas surgery, maybe not in 10 years. You may not be allowed to uh, in some way, just the way trauma is regionalized through the ACS. I suspect that will happen to HPV. So that's what I would say. Terrific insight. Maybe Adnan, if you could come up uh, and then also transition at some point. But please, com more comments, and then we're also going to open it up more broadly. But you're up, and I'd love your insights as well. Stay. So late. I didn't mean to scare you away. Scared no way. Uh, we, we are. We, 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 we actually transition actually because he's going to. Thank you. We, 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 and I, I don't know if we need to say anything after what Dr. Grimbecka said. That was a perfect <laughs> summation. <laughs> we actually wanted to kind of just stir the conversation with some questions. The questions are not the point. The, the real questions are the point. But if you actually go to the app, if you open the app, on, on the top, there's a, a button right underneath the uh, HBO to 2030, uh, 2023, uh, and you'll move as an audience. If you click on that, you should be able to, to get to the questions, or you can just click on this one, whichever is easier for, for you. Let's try to answer some, some of those questions. The session will record home. Oh, people are already answering. I love it. And again, this is just to kind of get some uh, that's like I'm back. Uh, I'm like Dr. Warner. I can't read that anymore. Ah, here we go. Where's the arrow to the bath button? Mm -hmm. I think it's supposed to be right over there. Thank you, Dr. McGregor. I apologize for that. But that's what the mic is for. It's the light on. Okay. I see. We have a problem. Let's move on to the next one because we want to have some questions, uh, some time to discuss things. But only five questions, so I'll just go through this. Hmm. Convinced him of something there. The video. Yeah, there's no question if you're going to do it. Yeah. Well, as well as the case doesn't go on. Okay, let's go on to the next one, please, sir. That's what we do. Supposing that the standard of care, the standard of this uh, of the assessment now is indeed the uh, program voucher at the station. Um, let's go on to the last one. I think it's the last one. I think we're going to have a as well here maybe. Oh, so well, no, well, please come up with your question, please. Thank you. Sorry. I I apologize. I sorry. again we, we we didn't want to we wanted to stir the pot. That's all. Please go ahead. Um, so here's a very difficult question, a difficult conversation to have. What if you get an HPB fellow and you train them and you don't feel that they're safe enough? to go out and practice. Mm. Have any of you up there dealt with this and how have you handled it? We had a fellow a few years ago that we actively dissuaded from pursuing HPV, a surgical oncology fellow. And that person's very happy and successful in melanoma and sarcoma. And I think that's a huge response mm -hmm. share. Thank you. So I'm going to do HPV surgery. Too late, they'll call you to say thank you. Sure. I would also say that those, you know, this is never a revelation that comes at the end of training, right? This is something where probably from day one, you've been concerned about that trainee. And this is, these are conversations to start having, you know, you got to give someone a chance. There are people coming at different levels into their training program, but you have to have, start having those conversations. 
Uh, in my career as a program director, um, we mm -hmm. have uh, failed to sign off on two graduates. It was very difficult conversation. Um, one of those people found a way to continue to to practice HPV surgery and and to various levels of 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 success. But it's also, you know, I think we have to be honest with people. And it's uh, again to bring it back. It's about protecting the patients, and just say that you're you're not standards you're not where we need to be i have concerns that after an adequate training experience we're still not there mm -hmm. you should be thinking about other opportunities or other avenues again as dr minter said it's up to the hospital and the subsequent you know hiring department chair or program surgeon in chief to call you and 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 get that evaluation because there's no sort of sign that they put on their forehead to say they didn't get credentialed but that is why also if we have credentialing process and a certification process, the absence of certification becomes a tangible message. Thanks so much. I mean, actually, Dr. Gurgula, if you don't mind, um, as uh, as chair of the Education and Training Committee, can you would you comment on that from a society perspective? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Alcedi. So I, I just want to emphasize that the, I agree with Dr. Cleary the time to identify that a trainee is not competent is not at the end of training. But just so everyone knows, um, as part of the HPD sur surgery certificate, we do have a list of criteria. It's not just case volume, um, but part of that is attestation from the program director. Um, and that needs to, and, and we look at that. So, um, Dr. Cleary has said he's not signed off on two, two fellows. We've had at least one to my knowledge. Um, but that's what we do from a society standpoint. Thank you so much. Can I just uh, ask something about is that okay? mm -hmm. which um, I think another which is actually to identify it, as you say, but also to just recommend that they do a second fellowship because some people come into a fellowship, a small program. Aren't really um, trained well enough to to be like a chief resident mm -hmm. level, and so they would be able to. Mm -hmm. So if you do two fellowships, not necessarily the same. We could do MIS, we could do HPV transplant, we could do Sir John. I mean, there's all sorts of combinations. So right. we just salvage it. Let's do two to say years of some other fellowship. And, and this is the work with Dr. Venter with respect to the EPA is the key thing here is to identify it early. But if you don't, you gotta realize that person has invested seven to nine years of their life to basically say, no, go out and without actually having a, a plan for them doesn't make sense. And I think that's what Dr. Claire is saying, what fits for them. A second fellowship maybe, or general surgeon maybe, but we have to figure out a way for them. Dr. Roger Elijah, please. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. So I just want to reflect on Dr. Minter's talks because we've been through this. This is like same again, mm -hmm. over again, right, mm -hmm. Rebecca? And it's great because we came to the same conclusions. Uh, the issues were 10 years down the line from our consensus conference in 2014, and we came to exactly the same conclusions. But why haven't we able to operationalize this? I think that there were a couple of things. Uh, one is We've actually, to speak to Dr. D'Angelica's point, we've actually controlled our numbers very well, maybe even too well with an HPV, right? There's 17 spots, I think, this year. And so it's not the issue with an HPV specifically number-wise, purely number-wise. The issue is how do we level the playing field across all of the tracks? And to be frank, as an applicant right now, if I was applying, with the odds of 100 to 80 for another track compared to probably about 50 to 17 for HPB, what would I apply for if I could come out and call myself an HPB surgeon? And we're beginning to see this. So a couple of things, um, you know, I believe that a tripartite certificate that speaks to this would be the way to go. And Dr. Mint and I disagreed on this initially, but I think I agree with her that actually lowering the bar to something that's reasonable across all tracks to start with may be the way to start that conversation. I don't think it's where we need to end, but it's a way to start that conversation because we have to talk about all of the tracks. 
the other thing so, is uh, if I, if I, could, I wanna uh, these are very important points because I, I know nobody knows this topic better than you so I want to kind of address them and, and so this no I, it's very important because I do think that there is these are two uh, very different philosophies on how to address the same problem and I, and, and I want to emphasize how much you've invested in, from years of your life into this so uh, it's not right or wrong but the point is like when we were doing this SWAT, especially with Dr. Bibiki talk about, the issue was that it, it, lowering the bar seemed to be contrary to what a lot of the stakeholders were talking about. Like, we already have a problem where we're hiring, like the Dr. Messman talked about, we're hiring people that they can't do what you tell me they can do. You're publishing guidelines saying, here's what the standard of care is for this patient, but then you hire, you're, you're graduating people that can't meet the guideline that you, the same society, published. So it's very problematic, and that's why the whole idea of lowering the bar to achieve the tripartite thing, which sounds exactly what all of us want to do, just did not seem in line with the quality that we want to perceive, we, we want to project. And the other side of saying, okay, we can control all societies, but let's control the message of saying at least our product can have a value and a name and a definition. And then people that want to meet that bar, meet that bar, and if they don't, it doesn't matter because at least the society knows what, what the value is. It's, you know. It has. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would agree with you if that's all we do. I think the key is to do that and to define what it is the value of the specialty is. Right now, part of the problem is you raise the bar, you get this disparity, but at the same time, people still don't understand what the field is. But I hear you completely. The problem is that, and I was with you too, trying to do that whole little trap. By the way, we were talking about dropping pancreas altogether to achieve the consensus. I don't think that speaks quality. So I, I'm just going to say I'm actually very unified with Rebecca on this. I think we've got a compromise to start the conversation. And and literally, I mean, we were in a room where I was screamed at in order to even start this conversation. Yeah. I tell you with her. But at least to start the conversation, we have to do this. And I agree that the FPD was a way to do it. Unfortunately, we missed that. Just for the group, it's unlikely that the uh, ABS is going to allow another FPD because they're going to let three through and follow them, which is a shame. But, uh, but I also just want to say one last comment before I sit, sit down, which is that the other part that we have in our, um, in, in our wheelhouse, why don't we hire our own people? There are people training HPP surgeons that don't hire their product. And I think that that, uh, I mean, I'm just going to say I've tried to mentor that in our practice. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's important as leaders, and I'm just going to say that we do that. If we believe in the product that we train. And thank you. I'm going to say thank you. I just want to tell you the concept of uh, FPD, if I'm saying that right, 
is one that we shouldn't let go. There will be exceptional situations where a surgical oncologist or a transplant surgeon may not have had adequate training and fellowship, but they're being hired, hired into a group that can mentor them for a few years and easily mm -hmm. turn them into a good HPV surgeon. And and accounting for that, I think, is important. I hope that's a reality. It's Absolutely. 30 years ago, that's how surgeons developed. They were hired into practices out of general surgery and learned as an attending. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alcady. I just want to make a couple of quick comments. I'm I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I'm not I'm not sure that we need to necessarily raise our standards. Well, what standards are we talking about? Perhaps making it a two-year, a two-year fellowships, perhaps standardize the curriculum. And what I do want to say about assessment, we're all talking about assessment and certification. We can't certify or assess people unless we have standardization across all programs. However, just what I want to say is it's not lower, we shouldn't lower our standards. We shouldn't lower what we have already established that Rebecca and Rohan and Paul Gregg sat around and wrote many years ago. We shouldn't lower those standards, but what we want to do is be the core society of HPV surgeons that invites other yeah. HPV surgeons from other tracks into, but we need to drive that. So we invite surgical oncology, we invite <laughs> transplant into our house, and we dual accredit. We dual certify these these uh, these fellows, and I think that that's the way to do it. It's not lowering. I don't think we should lower standards because we have good standards now, and that is case volumes, et cetera. But standardizing them, assessing them, and bringing other people into mm -hmm. our core house of HPBA perhaps is the way to go. Thank you so much. Well said. We're running out of time, so I'll have Dr. Zoram's uh, last question. Very challenging, terrific work, great conversation. I, I'd like to ask a question about the curricular piece. I was intrigued by the concept of adding a month of surgical oncology to the training. And I wonder when you guys were talking about this, did you think about GI? Did you think about transplant? Is there a way to get this um, knowledge? This is a cognitive piece, right? Because I don't want to go around on somebody in the bone marrow transplant unit for a month. But can we get all these really important cognitive things into the curriculum, maybe without necessarily a whole month on a different service? You know, we think about transplant is, yeah, you get a lot of good technical stuff, but man, there is a ton of great medical stuff, Absolutely. right? Doing gigantic wax on super duper sick patients. This is the concept of surgical oncology training. So it's as much cognitive as it is technical. So it, we, we, you don't you don't have to go well in the bone marrow transplant unit, but you'll go spend a few days a week for a month in the GI medical oncology office and learn about how to recruit patients to trial, uh, how to give adjuvant chemotherapy to patients suffering after a ripple or whatever. And you'll go sit in the radiation oncology suite and watch how the patient you refer for radiology radiation uh, gets it gets simulated and get stuck in something and what it's really like to see someone after radiation with burned skin. So I think that's really important, and I think it's it's. Something we couldn't have from surgical oncology. I agree for sure. And and I think it's great. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that, but I think if if that's the case, what we'll need to do is tailor that experience so people get all of that in a defined compressed. Hundred percent. I don't love how you think. In fact, and perhaps when we're saying raising the bar, we're not actually explaining what that means. It's not just about cases. It's exactly what you're saying. It's the idea of that we know transplant experience is helpful for HPC HPV surgeons. Why isn't that part of the mix? We know for, for many of our programs, we learned of, you know, going to GI, one of the things I loved about Seattle is that I was in the GI room all the time watching the U.S.'s and the RCPs. That told me a lot. So absolutely, that's part of the picture. But I don't know, as a, as a fellow, that um, the, the value of medical oncology, the value of radiation oncology experience, that they get in such oncology, like CGSL fellowships, that's after the bottom of the cover, right? Because um, you're trying to get a certain Critical value, also the value of medical child value as well, whether it's in the end. So, it's a lot of people that, you know, 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 it's a lot of people that, you
So obviously there's lots of work and discussion yet to be done on how to iron this out. It absolutely raise the bar is really more about standardization and broadening to make sure that we have all these elements and it is just about case numbers. I'd really like to thank everybody again, both the audience and for for provocative uh, questions and and comments, and the SWAT team for all the work, and this panel of our of uh, real leaders in our field, and both as surgeons and educators, um, for participating. Thank you all so much. It's impossible. <laughs> <laughs>